January 9th meeting of the Acton Board of Selectmen. And as always, uh, the first item on our agenda is citizens' concern. So if there's anyone in the audience who has uh, an issue they'd like to bring to the attention of the selectmen other than uh, items that are already on tonight's agenda and will be discussed, please come forward. Okay, seeing no one, um, we'll move on to the uh, chairman's update. Uh, town manager released his budget in December. Uh, this Saturday, uh, the selectmen met with the FinCom together to have our all-day budget Saturday. Every department head comes forward and uh, explains uh, their budget and how it's changed from the prior year. We certainly have some challenges this year that we'll be talking about when we address the ALG um, pro uh, proceedings later on in the agenda. But uh, once again, I was uh, impressed with the uh, energy and dedication that all of our town employees bring to their work. Uh, certainly, in my view, the town is run efficiently, and that's due to all the uh, expertise and hard work that our employees provide uh, in, in uh, providing uh, great services to our citizens. And it's not that we don't have issues with the way the town is run, and there's always uh, uh, ways to improve, but I'm convinced that all of our employees do the best job they can to try to uh, ensure that uh, the citizens get the best bang for their buck and the best services that the town can provide. Um, Santa Claus came to my street this year. Uh, it was a bitter cold and hard snowing uh, morning. I was there with my grandkids, uh, and so the, because of the weather, uh, Santa couldn't arrive in the usual uh, antique fire apparatus that he shows up in, but the uh, public safety police and fire personnel use their uh, vehicles to convey Santa around town, and it, it's, it's those kind of little things that uh, make Acton such a great place to live. Uh, town government, local government, is the basic building block which lays the foundation for our entire uh, uh, nation. And uh, I want to again compliment all the uh, all the employees for the great work they do, and wish them all the best in uh, 2017. And uh, in honor of the work they do to promote local government and continue our democracy, uh, we will. Uh, salute uh, the flag with the um, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, that concludes my uh, update. Uh, Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as, as noted, we were busy uh, preparing for uh, last week's Budget Saturday, and uh, we also had an ALG meeting last Thursday, which we will talk about a little later in the agenda. Um, just a few little updates. Um, uh, in the Fire Department, Eric Matthew has been um, promoted to the uh, rank of Lieutenant uh, we've just concluded uh, interviews for the Advanced Life Support Coordinator, and uh, uh, the police department has two new uh, police officers on, uh, that have uh, started a week ago Monday. Uh, the planning department is working on a, a bunch of different zoning articles uh, aiming for an annual town meeting, including, uh, once again, the rezoning of, of Brookside shops, uh, accessory apartments, and uh, some housekeeping as well as uh, some cluster development language. Um, and um, I think that's about it. So uh, thank you. OK, uh, let's see. Well, uh, the hearing is supposed to start at 7.10, so I think it's appropriate to read the notice at this point. The Acton Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on January 9, 2017 at 7.10 p.m. 
in the Francis Faulkner hearing room 204 at the Town Hall 472 Main Street Acton on the application of AP Pizzeria Incorporated doing business as AP Pizzeria at 168 Great Road Acton under section 140 of the Massachusetts General Laws for a common victualler license. Uh, the applications can be inspected at Town Hall during normal business hours. Uh, Mr. DiPiaxo here, please come forward. All right, well, thank you. Uh, my name is, good evening. My name is Antonio Carla Pachon. I did the application for changing my business name because before, two years ago, this the same name, AP. This is somebody changed, you know, back for AP, it's possible. You've been the owner all along, is that it, or did you just purchase the business? No, I own it. I am the owner of the okay. business, yeah. Uh, questions from the selectmen? Okay. It's just changing. Franny? Oops, sorry. It's um, just for changing it's a, the name. You just, yeah, yeah. This this is just, name. I just, I, one thing I just wanted to confirm that it was just changing the name. And this is so tiny, but um, in the application, there was an address without a town. And so it's, it sort of said, like, your address, but it didn't have the town in it. So I thought that might need to be corrected on the application. Um, the home address. But it was, I didn't have any trouble with the name change. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, where is Maitland Avenue? Are you, what town do you live in? I live in Low. Low? Yeah. Okay. All right, I make a motion to approve the common victualler license for AP Pizzeria, Inc. Second. Second. Okay, before I call the motion, let me just, uh, it, there was one uh, comment from the health department that you'll have to renew your uh, uh, food service permit from the Board of Health. Y yes, before you can operate. 17. Okay, yeah. for 17. And also, I didn't see a comment from the fire department, although you sent out, um, okay, uh, Can we make this a condition of uh, of the vote that uh, the fire department weigh in on this uh, before we would actually approve this, or do we need to? Do you think, or what? Yeah, What's the role know. of the fire department? Just the, obviously the premises and and the uh, the ovens yeah. and and uh, the fans and uh, I mean that's pretty important yeah, stuff to me. I mean nothing's changed. It's just so the name think. that's changed. Yeah, that's the name. Yeah, everything keeps the same. Yeah, does just the fire the department inspect? Do they do fire inspections of restaurants? Board of, Board of Health does, but what about the fire department? No, they don't. Yeah. Okay. I'm just thinking about that fire with the, that happened in Boston with the fans that was so disastrous. Um, I don't know. I don't know if they inspected that. That's the health department. Well, Maybe I mean, the health out. department will look at grease traps and fans. And okay. So, um, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome Thank back you. to town. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. We. Yeah. Oh, you'll make a request that usually we don't say anything. So I was to say, if you had time to kill, I was going to, I think it was Katie that suggested it. Yeah. About what? All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, okay. When we do selectmen's reports, that's, that's in, okay. Why don't we just do it now? We got a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, just a couple of items of uh, information. Uh, uh, my term is up in 
April, I guess, a town meeting this year, and I do intend to run for a new three-year term, so I'll be running for re-election. <laughs> My term is up also at the same time, and I'm going to re rerun also for re-election. Okay. So, moving on. Um, the Acton Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing on January 9th at 7.15 in the Francis Faulkner Hearing Room, uh, 204 in Town Hall, 472 Main Street, Acton, for an order to show cause for an alleged liquor license violation under Mass General Laws, Chapter 38, Section 34. Red, White, and Brew, 578 Mass Ave, Acton, Mass. The documentation can be inspected at Town Hall during normal business hours. Uh, let me ask the police officers to come forward. Chief, how are you? Uh, <laughs> well, all right, Deputy Chief. Um, I mean, I call Deputy Chiefs Chiefs, but, but anyway. Um, uh, you want to just give us your report, officers? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Well, we should ask any, any uh, citizens or business owners in the audience who intend to speak to also get sworn. Because it's a hearing? Is it, I right. just want to clarify. Because this is a public hearing. Right. Um, we need everybody who's going to speak in this hearing to stand up and swear that everything you say will be truthful and nothing but the truth. Whatever that is. Thank you. So you're the only person that's going to be speaking from the audience. Okay. Great. Okay. Deputy Chief Burroughs. Good evening. Uh, we're here tonight for an alleged uh, sale to an underage minor on uh, November 28th by Red, White & Brew. We have uh, Sergeant Fred Renschler here to read the facts into the case, and we have um, Detective Dean Keeler here to testify if there's any questions about the report. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, if the board's uh, ready on Monday, November 28th of 2016, Detective Keeler, I uh, was present right here with a blue shirt on, was in plain clothes uh, working his uh, routine detective shift. At that time, at 8.25 on the 28th of uh, November last year, at 8.25 in the evening, he was patrolling the West Square area. During this time, the detective noticed a male who appeared to be well under the age of 21 enter the Red, White, and Brew market. Being familiar with the layout of the market, the detective noted that the mail went towards where the alcohol items are kept for sale as opposed to the non-alcoholic items such as the sodas and the chips. The detective then continued to observe this mail while he was in the store, grab a six pack of an alcoholic turned out to be Mike's Hard Lemonade. The young male took the item to the register where the sale was then rung up by a female cashier. After the sale, the subject then left the store and got into an awaiting motor vehicle. This motor vehicle was subsequently by Detective Keeler, and as a result of the investigation that took place on the scene, it was determined that the male who purchased the alcohol was in fact 18 years of age. The male was arrested and charged with minor possession, and as a byproduct of the arrest, a Connecticut driver's license was recovered from that same young male, which made him 22 years of age. Following the arrest of the male, the detective then spoke to the operator of the vehicle that picked him up and drove him away from the store. And he asked the operator of that vehicle why they were at the red, white, and blue uh, brew on this particular evening. The operator of the vehicle then told Detective Keeler, it's because they almost never ask for identification. <coughs> the detective then went back to red, white, and brew to speak to the cashier who made the sale to the youth. The detective then spoke to, I believe it's Sonita Patel, the owner, uh, the sister's, the owner, the owner's sister. And also, while he was speaking with Sunita, I believe, is it Bupesh Kumar? Yeah. Sir. Uh, he was there as present as well during the uh, same conversation that he had with Sunita. At that particular time, the detective asked Sunita if she recalled selling the alcohol to the young male and if she had requested any ID from him. Sunita indicated that she did remember the sale, but that she did not ask for an ID because of the frequency in which the male had come into the store in the past. 
Detective Keeler then informed Sunita that the male was only 18 years of age and not 21. After this, Mr. Patel was adamant that the male was 21 because he was in the store, quote unquote, all of the time. Detective Keeler then asked Mr. Patel if he'd ever requested ID from the male in the past, and if so, what state was the ID from? Mr. Patel stated to Detective Keeler that he had checked the ID before, and it was a mass ID. Uh, Detective Keeler noted in his report that there was no other ID, excuse me, that there was one other ID on the uh, person, on the, eight, on the youth's, uh, in his property, and it turned out to be a mass ID, but it was a legitimate mass ID, which only established his age to be 18. So essentially, that's the facts of the case right now. Detective Keeler will be available to the board if you have any further questions. Uh, but essentially, the sale was completed to an underage person. There was a, a phone, uh, a fake Connecticut ID on his person, but was not valid. Janet. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to have questions, I guess, for the, the licensees reps, but um, I have a question about if you have somebody who cards somebody and is presented with one of the, the preferred IDs, I understand that you can produ produce, there's no preference as to, as to form of ID, um, but obviously if you present one of the listed uh, IDs in, the, in the, mass MG, the mass general laws, then you get the benefit of the doubt, assuming that the ID is legitimate and not fake. But, okay, so if somebody presents what appears to be a legitimate mass ID, one of these that are listed in the MGL, and it turns out to be fake, is that, I mean, obviously the person who buys and is underage is in trouble. But I'm wondering what happens to the merchant, because this, there's a similar law, there's a federal law that requires that when you're employing somebody, you go and you check, you have to verify, or they used to have to verify your identity and all that sort of thing, and a lot of people produce their passports and take care of it. But, um, you know, there was a certain amount of uh, fake IDs, you know, it was a problem with that. And of course, you've got HR people who aren't experts in discerning whether a document is authentic or not. But I didn't know um, whether if somebody has been, has carded, has been carded and has, and has looked at what appears to be a legitimate mass ID and turns out to be fake, whether there's, if you're aware of any, any break for the, for the, the store, the package store, as opposed to the, the individual who's carrying the fake ID. I, I was just curious because it seemed like it would be kind of stringent. <laughs> uh, yep. Unfortunately, my understanding of uh, Chapter 138 is uh, you do so at your own peril. What I mean by that is there are six uh, specific forms of ID carved out in the ABCC rules uh, as acceptable IDs in which you, know, you will be relieved from liability if you somehow forge, alter, or misrepresent a mass license and in good faith the store owner takes that mass license and it appears to, through no fault of their own that it was a legitimate representation of a mass ID or, or a passport or ID card or, or I, uh, passport card or military ID. If, if the merchant took that and on, again, at face value, mm -hmm. they made a good faith inquiry as the validity, maybe cross-checked as, as the person, uh, a verifying question such as their address, name, date of birth, height, um, I would say they could be relieved. I don't see those facts present here. No, no. I, I was trying to figure out whether uh, what other towns or what other people have done, and I had read that in some, there's a bar in Back Bay in Boston, I guess that was a favorite watering hole, and, and they had a problem with people underage coming in and all that. And one, I think they installed a device that actually, I don't know how it works, but it actually somehow scans. And, and if, obviously, if the scanning doesn't verify the identification, then they just refuse to serve. I mean, it was, they said it was in their interest to do that, and it was worth their investing in this equipment. and, and sort of erring on the side of, you know, not serving, not selling, whatever, rather than taking a chance. So, um, okay, no, that's, those are really, I mean, the, the facts are pretty clear cut in this case, so, thanks. I don't have questions right now. Uh, oh, Katie. 
Um, this is a bit of a follow-up to Janet's, but my question was just clarifying, because my understanding is that one of the six forms of accepted ID is not an out-of-state ID, correct? That is correct. So even if the person had presented the Connecticut ID that showed them over 22, that should not have been accepted as a valid form of ID? No, and I actually, we do have a copy of the ABC rules, uh, uh, just a frequently asked question sheet, and it's on their website. I, but I, that's not, and would that be included, and in, I know we've often encouraged in the past or told people in the past they have to do like tips um, training, is that that would be included in this kind of training, that that's not a valid form of ID? My understanding is that yes, that would be included in TIPS training. Okay, thank you. Janet. And what I'm looking at here is, <clears throat> I have the MGL, but I also have uh, frequently asked questions from the ABCC's website. And what they say uh, after the list of IDs, and they say mass driver's license, mass liquor identification card, mass ID card, passport issued by the U.S. or a government that is officially recognized by the U.S., a passport card for a passport issued by the U.S., and a military ID card. And it, it goes on to, to explain, you know, what weight they give these cards. But they said, while a licensee may choose to rely upon any form of ID to obtain proof of age, only these specific six forms of ID provide a defense to a charge of service, delivery, or possession of alcoholic beverages by a person under 21 years of age. So, I mean, those are, you can use other cards, but you take a greater risk that not only are they going to be fake, but you're not going to even have the benefit of the doubt, which seems to be not so modified, <laughs> even if you use a apparently valid mass ID that turns out to be fake. But anyhow, I just wanted to make clear that, I mean, obviously, if you happen to rely on an out-of-state ID that turned out to be valid, then it would be okay. But obviously, if you've got sort of an appearance before you, somebody who appears to be sort of young, it's probably always better to card the person. So anyhow, thank you. Uh, I uh, understand. I, I missed a meeting where this board uh, considered a prior complaint against the same establishment uh, and and issued some sanctions. Uh, I, if my memory is correct, that was a service of underage uh, patrons as well. That was service to an underage minor, and that was some alcohol consumption by the clerk that was working that night as well. There were two violations. And do you know how long these? Uh, this, these particular owners have owned this establishment? I'm not sure off the top of my head. Okay. Opinion. Are you aware of other uh, other complaints other than, than that one previous one that we Not that mentioned? I'm aware of, other, okay. than, other than the previous one and this one. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, all right, this is the opportunity for the owners or uh, other citizens to come forward and, uh, and address this issue. I'm Nirval Patel. I will be representing um, Red and White Brew. Um, all I have to say is the guy who was involved in this incident used to come into the store all the time with the ID, which stated that he was over 21 years of age. And as far as we know that he used to bring a Massachusetts ID. So, and because of this, since he, since we um, looked at the statement and it said uh, that uh, um, he had a fake ID from Connecticut, we also bought a machine which um, scans all of the IDs. And that's all I have to say. Um, sure. Go ahead. But do you, are you saying you, since that point you've bought a yeah. machine that scans IDs? Yes. And would that ID, now you're not allowed to take a Connecticut license, so it, yeah. would, it would scan the Massachusetts ID and what would it do? What would it say? Um, it's going to say if it's a valid ID or not. So if it's a fake, oh, it's going to come up as arrows saying it's not. Okay. And what, what about this business of I see them a lot, so I stop giving. At what point do you stop asking for the ID? Um, like, once we get to know the person, that's when we stop asking for the ID, because they're in there, like, probably once or two days or something like that. 
And is that legal? Can I ask? I mean, is, is that legal? Do you always have to ask for the ID? Or when you get to know a customer, can you legally stop asking for the ID? In this particular instance, um, I would urge the board to look at the facts of the, the specific incident of IDing or not. I think that the past history um, is not some that we have as, as good information on for this particular uh, purchaser. So I think that this particular purchase is most relevant for us. But I'd be happy to answer that question um, further for the board in, in writing or otherwise. It would be important for me to know in order to pass the information along to the business and to other businesses so they know like what's like do they have to ask every time even though they've seen this person in here every day for 364 days or is it legal to say I've seen you I've seen your ID I know you I know I mean I'm I understand that yeah. it was a fake ID I know that you are there and I from what I see we don't really have evidence that it was Massachusetts ID we haven't seen this Massachusetts ID right that yeah apparently yeah he, that's why we got the machine which checks all the IDs. Right, but so you're just remembering that it was a Massachusetts ID? We know that, it, well, as far as we know, it was a Massachusetts ID. Even I checked it. it how long, even like how long before, mom. like how long before this incident had you checked his Massachusetts like, ID? Probably or, like month and a half. And the thing was that he got into one of these incidents before where he got in trouble for using a fake ID. So we don't know when he like switched the ID to a connect Connecticut ID. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Like there's a lot of kids who go to bars, clubs in Boston and they get their ID taken away because they're fake. So we don't know if his ID was taken away by someone else before this incident happened. Janet, do you have questions? I, I actually have a question, not for Mr. Patel, but for Detective Keeler, because I think in the police report I saw a reference, I think Detective recognized this young purchaser as somebody who was kind of a habitual pat purchaser, underage purchaser, and so, and had, so I gather that you had prior experience with this person buying uh, liquor inappropriately, and I, I don't know if you, it, I just, I'm wondering how it is that you could identify, I don't know if there were any of those prior instances involved the red, white, and blue, apparently not, because they would otherwise perhaps know that this person is not not 21. But. Yeah, so after he was stopped, he was, uh, he was identified. Uh, I recognized him as somebody that I had uh, dealt with for a prior uh, liquor possession violation. As far as where that came from and how he procured mm -hmm. that, I don't know anything about that. He had it in his possession in a parking lot in a car and he was charged subsequently, but that was the extent of the prior incidents with me. Okay, yeah. I, I think it's just the fact that he's underage and he has it. It's uh, what kind of, what happened with the, the ID check, I guess, is it doesn't matter if, in fact, the ID wasn't valid, so. Um, yeah, and, and, and again, it, it falls on the policy of the stores as far as whether they want to do it every single time, whether they want some places you go and they say, if you look like you're under 40, we're going to ask for the ID. If any of you are familiar with Donnellan's, it doesn't matter if you're, how old you are, they'll ask you for your ID. That's their policy, whether it's they do you or not. It's very flattering. I don't mind it anymore either, you know. But, um, <laughs> that, you know, it it's really comes down to a store policy, yeah. but, the, but the liability does fall on the licensee if a violation occurs and a sale is made to somebody that's underage. It's 100% on them if they didn't ask and get mm -hmm. the, 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 the proper identification. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a follow-up question, if that's all right. Sure, sure. Jen, sure. for the detective? Um, yes. Okay. Um, about how long ago was this person's previous violation? Do you remember? I mean, like, are we talking a year ago? Are we talking a couple months ago? He was, he was a minor at the time, so it was at least a year ago. He's 18 now. At, okay. at the time of this incident, he was under 18 at the time. So it was quite a while ago, though. It, I believe it was uh, a little over a year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Katie? Yes, I have a, a question for you, Mr. Patel. Um, the woman who, sir, who um, 
made the sale that night, Sunita, was she, um, so she did not, had she checked the ID of this person before? Mm, yeah, she did. Okay. And has she been tip strained? Yes. Okay. And so your policy in your store does not involve always checking the IDs. Do you have any policy to always check the IDs of people that are or look like they're under a certain age? Yeah. Like if they look under 40 years old, like the sergeant said, we do check their IDs. So but then once, why wasn't his ID checked that night? I mean, he clearly looks like he's under 40 years old if he's 18. No, once we got used to him coming, used to coming, used to him coming into the store, we knew that he was over 21 years of age because he was showing us that fake ID. Okay, but so your policy is not to check. You do not have a policy that says you will always check the ID every time of somebody who looks under 40 years of age. Yeah. Okay, I, this is gonna be more of a comment. I mean, I think it's extremely clear here that you serve somebody who's under sold alcohol to somebody who's under 21. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's happened recently and as Detective Killer noted, the liability is on you. So whether you're, that's your policy or not, you should really rethink your policy because again, as Detective Killer noted, if you go to Donlin's, if I go to Fenway Park or if I go to the garden, they check every ID and the reason they do that is because the liability is on them and they've lost their, the garden lost their liquor license for a night and that's, you know, millions of, it's a lot of money that they, it's thousands and thousands of dollars that they lost that night. So they don't want to do that again. So they are going to check everybody's ID every time, whether it's me coming in or offense Steve, Steve coming in looking a little over 21, they're going to, and whether Steve goes every to every Celtics game and always goes to the same, you know, stand, they're going to check his ID because the liability is on them. So I think that's something you need to keep in mind that the, that the liability is on you. So if it's some kid coming in, if somebody comes in every day and you see, you know, you've seen their ID once, you should still check it every single time because this is your fault under the law. You served, very clearly served somebody who's under 21. Okay. How long have you owned the uh, business? Um, on the Halloween night of um, 2015. Okay, so a little over a year, a yeah. year, a few months. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't understand something you said about this patron who was arrested. You, you talked about him having had a, had a fake ID or something that got taken away from him. Were you, was that, do you know that? Or was that just no, an example of on, something, huh? It was written on the um, statement. Written on the statement? Yeah. Well, the Connecticut ID. You said he had a mass ID. Yeah, that's what we know that he had a mass ID. But and you, you know that was taken away from him because it was, uh, it was uh, a fake ID? Is that what you said? I didn't understand what you talked about, Boston and people going into bars in Boston and having IDs taken away from them. You weren't talking about this particular person. Yes, I was. I think okay. I was speculating. Yeah. You're just speculating. You don't know that. You're just thinking that might have happened. Yeah. Okay. But and so, so you knew that or you thought that might have happened on the night the guy came in and you didn't ask him for an ID? We didn't ask him for the ID because we got used to him coming into the store and we, get, we gained trust on him by seeing his fake ID, which we didn't know that was fake or not. The woman... The woman that was in the car, are you familiar with the woman that was with the man that night too? No, okay. but we checked with our neighbors, which is the hair salon, and they, they know those two people. And they even told us that the girl herself, she has a fake ID, which actually scans. So they told us to be careful about her also. Well, she told the officer, um, it's well known they almost never ask for identification at your establishment. What do you have to say about that? You, you lost your license for a couple of days the last, just a few months ago. One day was it because you served underage patrons and you're not asking for uh, IDs for people that come into your store. No, we are actually ask, asking yeah. for IDs. Except for this person. <laughs> 
I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just have a quick question for Mr. Patel. Okay. Mr. Patel, last time when your uh, business, when the business was, uh, had its license suspended for serving underage patrons, um, you were also asked to provide to the board proof of completion of your tips off-premises training for all employees at the business. Have you yeah. done that? I do have the e-tips certifications. You do this evening yeah. with you? Yeah. And that's, does that also cover um, the clerk who uh, ID or the clerk who sold the alcoholic beverages to the yeah. purchaser? To, okay. Uh, and have you also submitted a copy of your alcoholic beverage sales policy to the board? I required? haven't done that, but I have it with me today. I have a question just about what it's like to own a place. If you sell to an underage person and they kill someone on their way home, are you, is the person who um, sold it to the underage person responsible in some way for that death? I think in that particular instance, I'd have to look into it. I know that there are dram shop acts and things like that in certain states. I'm not sure if they would apply in this particular situation. I just wondered what kind of pressure is on a store owner in that way, because that's what I really worry about. I look at the license, well, when we deliberate, I'll express my opinion. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, no. Oh, go ahead. I don't. Uh, do we ask for the deputy chief's <laughs> recommendation no, or usually, the chief's recommendation we, now or no, after we close? We close the hearing and find a okay. violation. Okay. And ask. Okay. So at this point, can we have a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the hearing is closed. We won't take any further information except for the deputy chief's recommendation and. Uh, it's now open for board uh, consideration. I, I, I see a violation um, of they sold to an underage person <laughs> without, um, without looking at their ID. I do understand that what they're saying is that they were looking at an ID in the past I'm sorry that we haven't seen that ID through any of these conversations that apparently existed, um, a mass ID that apparently existed and apparently disappeared, um, such that there was only a Connecticut ID now. Um, but it just makes me angry because they can, these underage drinkers couldn't historically have caused death and pain for people. <laughs> And it really upsets me when I see my signature on the license to give you a license to sell. I want to know that you're doing it responsibly. And if it's, as this young woman said, and it's easy to buy in there without giving their license, and this is just like two months after we saw you back here before. So I thought that, okay, now they're going to be better and they're going to get re tip certified and they're going to. Um, be following the law, and now I'm worried. Now, I do understand from you that you, and I do understand doing that. If I were seeing the same person come in and I had seen their ID, I would also feel comfortable. But I think what I would do, considering the ramifications if they got into an accident or they drowned or whatever else happens when underage people are drinking um, or they hurt somebody, I won't go into all those things, but um, I would think that when someone's close to the age, I can see if they look like Steve. No, I can see if they're not if they're if they're clearly around age 40. Um, I wouldn't think that, but if they're younger, I would think to more often get their ID. And after the last event, and after losing your license for a day. I would have thought that, okay, now things will be as they should be. And so this was upsetting to me. Well, 
Well, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I'll add that it's clear there is a violation, and, and Franny, I don't think it matters whether or not we saw the Massachusetts ID because that doesn't matter about whether or not there was a violation. Um, they did not check the ID this time. This was a violation. If they had checked that ID and it was a fake ID, or if they checked the Connecticut ID, it's not a valid ID, they're liable for this, and this was their fault. So there's a clear violation here that they sold to somebody under 18. So I think that's easy. What we do next might be different. But. Janet? No, I agree with what every, every, everybody else has said, and I, I think that it really, in this case, it doesn't matter what young underage drinkers might do. It's just that they're not supposed to be um, buying liquor or, or possessing it or drinking it. So, so um, it's just the, the act of, of acquiring the liquor that is the problem from their perspective. And, and it's obviously a problem from the merchant's perspective. So um, I think that the policy, whatever it is, I mean, this would be a suggestion I would make uh, when we finally come to recommendations. But I think that policy had better say that you know, check every every idea every time. I mean, the way the Donnellans or or, or Fenway does, um, rather than err on the side of sort of guessing. Um, I recall from the last hearing that I thought there was a representation that yeah, the practice was going to be that you were going to check every ID, and maybe that meant IDs of people you didn't know. Uh, People like me, I'd waltz in. Oh yes, we'll check your ID because we don't. Even though I'm clearly over, over 21, I think. But uh, but but then once you get to know somebody, then you don't check the IDs. And and while that may be an acceptable practice in some stores um, where they don't have um, problems, just differentiating between people who are underage and people who are over. I, I think that in your case, it really you've got to leave discretion and judgment out of it and just check everybody. And, and obviously, in this case, if you had checked the ID, you would have found two. You would have found the Connecticut ID, and you would have found the mass ID that identified him uh, truthfully or, or accurately as being 18. Um, and you wouldn't have sold, I assume, anyhow. But uh, no, I agree with what everybody said. This is a clear violation. I mean, there's just no way around it, so. Anybody else? I mean, I agree it was a clear violation. I think our main deliberation is on what we should do uh, in respect to, with respect to that, not whether or not there was a violation. Okay, well then I, th I think we should probably take a vote to find a violation. So if somebody wanna make that motion. Jessica Lee, help me and just make sure I do it correctly. <laughs> that should I say, I move to find a violation under Chapter 138 of the general laws that there was um, a sale to a minor, and I'll sell alcohol to a minor. Or can I just say a violation under Chapter 138? Um, a sale of an alcoholic beverage. Beverage to a minor. To a person under 21. Okay, to a person under 21. <laughs> you'll, you'll pretty that up, Lisa, to me, the actual. <laughs> Second. Okay, thank you. Lisa will make it pretty. So. Yeah. All, all in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. So we're now into deliberations about uh, what the penalty should be. And who wants to start off? Oh, chief. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, based on the fact that we're here again for a similar violation in a fairly short period of time, we'd be recommending a two or three day suspension. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chang? Uh, so I think that it's completely unacceptable that an establishment that has been owned by these people for uh, a little over a year has had two underage sale violations in that time span. Um, I would recommend a harsher penalty than the chief uh, has recommended because frankly, um, as the owner of such an establishment, uh, they should be aware that this sort of thing falls on them and that they need to, um, and that they need to really um, be wary of and, and take this legal responsibility seriously. Uh, it seems to me very self-evident that since they've been here twice in the last you know, few months at the tail end of uh, last year and the beginning of this year that they aren't taking it seriously. Um, and I think that the board's decision should reflect that. Any other comments, Katie? Yeah, I mean, I'll agree. I'm, I'm 
I'm pretty upset and I'm pretty frustrated with you guys because this, you know, you've owned this store for under a year and it wasn't that long ago that you were in here for a similar violation for selling to somebody under 21 and that, you know, you seem to still have a reputation as a store that doesn't card people and that seems to be true because you didn't card this gentleman. And I don't care if you'd carded him in the past. You need to card somebody every time they come in because it's just not acceptable and it's not, this is a privilege to have a liquor license. It's not your, your right as an owner. Um, and, you know, we're supposed to be taking into account the, the you know, safety, public safety um, in, you know, of our town and people in our town when we make determinations about this. And I am worried about the public safety because I'm not convinced that you're going to go back and implement good policies and actually card everybody every time they come into this store. Um, you know, I'm, I'm appreciate that you purchased the, the reader, but the reader doesn't work on its own. You've got to actually take the ID in order to, you know, test whether or not it's, it's valid. So, um, you know, I just, I'm, and I, you know, we told you that everybody had to be re-TIP certified, and apparently they have. Again, you know, my understanding of the TIP certification is that it would tell you that you need to ID people, that it would explain that out-of-state IDs are not valid and these other things, and it, so I'm just not sure that that really sank in. Um, so I'm frustrated, and I agree that, you know, the, the um, we should recommend or we should suspend the liquor license for longer than two or three days, and I would say probably a week. I mean, I'll just say that uh, it's, it's uh very well known that certain establishments get reputations, certainly it goes very quickly through um, the high school and uh, other underage uh, people in town, uh, that uh, there are places to go where you can buy alcohol that uh, they won't card you on. And I'm disturbed by the attitude of this owner um, who doesn't appear to uh, run a responsible establishment that adheres to those requirements. I will, uh, I, uh, there, there have been similar cases before the State Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission where they uh, recommended to the Lowell Licensing Commission, which was, would have been the City Council, I suppose, in Lowell, or the Liquor License Commission there, that uh, for this exact same violation, there be a uh, license be suspended for a period not to exceed seven days. So. Uh, I also agree that uh, it, it requires uh, a more a serious uh, penalty in order to ensure that uh, um, these owners take their um, responsibility seriously. Yeah, I have a question. I'm actually not um, on board with being um, more stringent only because I'm not convinced that just a longer suspension in and of itself is going to make a difference. Um, and I don't know if we're in a position to be able to require, impose other requirements on this licensee, um, such as, I mean, it's not just the TIPS training, but I, you know, I honestly think that they, whatever their policy is, if it doesn't make clear that they have to, they have to card every single customer that comes in every single time, it doesn't matter how well you know the person until they have a record of selling, uh, selling product um, without showing up before us for selling to somebody underage, I think that they need to establish that they understand, they understand the law and they take it seriously. But I'm, I don't see, I don't really am not convinced that I understand that there's loss of business, but I'm not convinced that just um, the loss of an additional four days or something or three days of business is in itself going to be sufficient um, to make them see the light. So I would like to have some other some teeth in it other than just um, length of time so I, 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 our ultimate authority is to um, pull the license altogether um, and, and uh, you know so we could certainly send a stern warning that if we see these uh, parties here again in the future um, that is a strong possibility it it always bothers me that there, there are solutions to these things. What I'm worried is that if you find a fake license, I would like there to be something that happens like, okay, you, you put it through your machine, you find out it's a fake license, you then ask for their driver's license or you ask for another ID. And if they, 
what I'm getting at is I don't want, I want to make sure that they're, they're not able to come back and, you know, with another ID. Oh, today, don't worry about it, he has a working ID today or something. I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Um, so I just want to say that. But I don't require that it be longer than the recommended time. Um, I believe the store people, the, the owners, you're, are you, you're one of the, the owners? I'm the owner's son. Okay. Um, that they're, you know, they looked at the ID enough that they believed that it existed, and so they technically, yes, there was a violation, and we are giving a penalty for that. But um, I don't think that in itself was evidence of this wanton view of the lightness of selling to someone underage. I don't know if we have evidence that there was that. That's lighter. if you believe that they checked a Massachusetts driver's license, which apparently must have been fake. I don't believe it. Uh, Franny, um, regardless of whether or not they check, checked a previous mass ID that was or was not fake, um, the 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 attitude, dem at least in my opinion, I'm I'm not really considering that factor. Um, what what I'm considering is the fact that the last time these um, the this establishment was in front of us, um, it was presented that um, they had a reputation that um, you know they were a place that didn't ask for ID. Um, this was something that was stated in the last time the last time that, that this establishment was in front of us. Um, and it's obvious to me that that was not a, of concern to them because they didn't put in place a policy to affect change in that and they still have that reputation. Um, and again, this violation happened with that reputation because of that reputation. Um, and so to me, um, if, if I were an owner of a liquor store with that establishment and I had had a violation because of it, um, I, would be, I would be very aggressive about trying to alter that reputation um, and make sure that um, you know, underage uh, people who were trying to purchase liquor would not be doing so from my establishment. Um, and so it's obvious that didn't happen. All right. um, and so therefore, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think that the owners have taken sufficient action um, to, um, to mitigate uh, sort of their reputation in the community as well as, as, well as to uh, execute their responsibility as responsible store owners um, to ensure that alcohol does not end up in the hands of minors. Um, and, so, and so from that perspective, I do believe that it's necessary to, to ensure that that happens. Um, and that I think that in order to do so, uh, we have two options. One is to just pull the liquor license entirely, which I don't think is uh, appropriate at this point. Uh, and the second is to enforce a harsher penalty. Uh, and so therefore, given that those are the two options, uh, I'm going to choose the one that I feel is the more, or more appropriate. And so that's my logic, and I thought I would present it to you. So we're talking about you folks who advocate for a week, five days, seven days. I mean, are you talking business days, or what is that? And then we also, you'd also have to specify which days, because we went through this before. Yeah, I, I think I assume that. they're open seven days a week. I mean, that's the, they're a I don't know. We, we shouldn't assume. Are they open seven days a week? Do we? You know, they're open seven days a week. OK. Um, I think uh, calendar days is fine. Um, you know, um, package stores are, if they're not open seven days, they're open six days. And so I, I wouldn't really um, hedge much on the way of one way or the other. I would just say calendar days. Lisa nodded and said there's seven, so. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Jingzhen. I think that, you know, this, I, again, that, they were before us before, and a one-day suspension didn't really, wasn't a wake-up call that this is serious and that their policies need to change. And I think a seven-day one will hopefully be and will restore public safety because I do think it's a public safety issue. So my recommendation would to be to say that we suspend their liquor license from January 29th through February, the week of January 29th through February 4th. And I can make a motion if you want. Um, sure, why don't you? Okay, I, I move to suspend the license for red, white, and brew uh, for the week of January 29th through February 4th. Second. 
All right, the motion's been made and seconded to suspend the license for seven days. Um, any further discussion, comments on the motion? All right, there being no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, the motion passes uh, four to one. Thank you, guys. Thanks. I would like to see how well that reader is working. All right. Could I? I had the hearings over with. I think we're done. I don't. Okay. You want to talk? Go into the okay. store and well, talk and check it. out the reader. That's fine. But we're not going to have any further discussion tonight about it. Okay. All right, the next item on the agenda is uh, Selectman's Business Acton Cleanup Week, April 22nd to April 29th. Uh, I believe we have representatives of Green Acton here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Jim Snyder Grant um, in West Acton. Um, so Acton's had a cleanup day for 20 years, uh, and for the last few years, uh, Green Acton has had the privilege of being the lead sponsor. As the co-president of Green Acton, I'm happy to announce that this year we're partnering with the Acton Chinese American Civic Society to run cleanup. So we're here to describe what the activity will be about this year and to ask for your support in declaring this a town event so that we can have access to town support, as we have in the past. So um, to that end, I'd like to introduce Alyssa Kong and Rachel Xiang, juniors at the acton Boxborough Regional High School, and representatives of the Acton Chinese American Civic Society, who can tell you more. Hello, I'm Rachel from North Acton. Um, and I'm Alyssa from Central Acton. So, the Acton Chinese American Civic Society is a local civil organization that promotes civic engagement and cultural enrichment in order to strengthen our community. The ACACS started to be involved with Acton Cleanup Day last year when members of the organization staffed the table in front of the Acton Memorial Library. One takeaway was that many people who wanted to help out were not available on that one set date. Also, we learned that many more places in Acton would benefit from some cleanup including some of our busy commercial areas. So this year, we would like to have an entire Acton Cleanup Week, not just one day. We will be seeking help from various groups in Acton to clean up during the entire week of April 22nd to April 29th. As in the past, we will have the largest day of cleanup be on the last Saturday in April, April 29th. We will need the town's help, as in previous years, to have extra trash containers and trucks at our gathering sites on Saturday, April 29th. We are also hoping to get your help in having a good place to gather the trash that will be collected the week leading up to then. We will be calling on the town's help in publicizing the event. We are looking forward to a big cleanup event this year and hope to help make Acton an even more beautiful place to live, to work, and to go to school. Thank you. Questions, comments from the board? I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Green Acton for continuing to do this and to ACACS for, for joining in and uh, stepping up and, and helping out. And I think it's great that you're expanding it to a whole week um, and that you guys kind of recognize that maybe that will, you know, allow more people to be involved. So I think it's really wonderful and just wanted to thank you and I wholeheartedly um, approve offering our, our the town support. Janet. Yeah, I have no questions. I think it's great that you're extending it to a week. Uh, it's sort of sad that every year you have to have a cleanup day and there's more than enough stuff to fill all those bags. I mean, I done it one, did it one year and I even came up with a sawhorse that somebody had abandoned, which, uh, yeah, I had to drive my car back, pick that up. But anyhow, um, so we have a whole week, so we'll have a much cleaner act, and we hope as a result, but uh, kudos to... Uh, you two young women for for stepping up and and helping your community i think it's all a good good thing that the high school has with getting the students involved in the community very young uh because uh we appreciate certainly as uh, public officials we certainly appreciate seeing young people 
uh, helping out in the community at a very early age and hope that when they become adults, they'll continue to that, that trend. So thank you very much. Well, similar thank yous, as well as for bringing something more positive than an alcohol hearing. <laughs> um, and I also, um, I had a comment and question. I think my memory is that the Act and Cleanup Day was founded by Jamie Eldridge years ago, or was he one of the early organizers before he became a representative or a senator? Um, Act and Cleanup Day started in South Acton, uh, actually started by Jamie's mom, Betsy. Um, what Jamie did was to um, uh, carry it to the entire town, to expand it from South Acton to the whole town. So, uh, so I hope it leads to wonderful things for all of you. <laughs> um, I also, that leadership, I still remember Charlotte Sagoff when I first heard of Jamie Eldridge's existence, the environmentalist Charlotte Sagoff, who was then in her 90s or close to it at that time, um, referring to that young man helping out with, you know, who was running for office, who had worked so hard on Act and Clean Up Day. I also had a question about rivers. It always sounds like so much fun to wade through the rivers cleaning up. And is that included in Act and Clean Up Day? Um, in the past, uh, we've sometimes had volunteers who are willing to uh, clean up streams that we've identified as having trash near them. Um, some years we don't get to that. Um, some years we do. There's also the uh, Assabet River cleanup day um, that occurs on a separate day where um, the, uh, the uh, Assabet Three Rivers group um, brings a lot, of, a lot of skill and volunteer energy to cleaning up the Assabet, including the little stretch that goes through the, uh, the corner, south corner of Acton. Okay, I have a couple of questions for Jim, but before I do that, let me ask the town manager to uh, let people know what the town is doing to support this effort. Well, one of the things uh, we have to work out in, in uh, the public works director will meet with uh, these folks is, is the issue of roll-off containers, uh, how, where we're going to put them, how we're going to utilize them. We, we have our own, but, you know, they're part of the landfill operation, so I saw I should say transfer station. So Corey's going to sit down with, uh, with Jim and others and, and try to work that out. And I also understand we're hang we've we've scheduled time to hang the banner so that there's publicity. We have, we have banners uh, approved to be hung, correct? Okay, I'm wondering what we can do to um, try to prevent uh, the worst of this problem from happening in the first place. I mean, every time I drive down Knox Trail, it kills me to see all those plastic bags hanging in the trees uh, on near the Assabet River. Um, we had uh, a. Uh, I guess it was a uh, site plan review for Idlewild. Uh, some of the neighbors came in and complained about trash that was blowing off of Idlewild onto their property. The owner agreed to take some steps to try to prevent that. Um, first of all, is Green Acting considered a ban on plastic bags at all? Is that on your agenda? Um, we've discussed it. Um, Green Acton, being a small group, tends to only take on campaigns that we we have, you know, burning volunteer energy to work for, and we haven't quite found that energy yet. Uh, I do note that uh, that Jamie and others have filed statewide uh, plastic ban bags uh, for a number of years, and we wholeheartedly support that. Um, if there were people uh, in this room or beyond who wanted to work on a plastic bag ban, a single-use plastic bag ban specifically for Acton, I'm sure they could find support and help at Green Acton for that. Okay, thanks very much. I second all the uh, previous comments of board members about uh, your good work, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, next item on the agenda is a request for a waiver of building permit fees from the Discovery Museum. Uh, I believe we have Neil Gordon, the uh, executive director of the museum. And Neil, we do have a letter uh, in the file uh, that uh, you forwarded to the board. Uh, but for, for uh, purposes of the people at home, um, I'd ask you to um, uh, tell them uh, Great. exactly what, well, thanks why you're here. Thanks for uh, having me here tonight. I have, uh, if I can, uh, a picture of what we're about to do. To 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, so thanks for um, having me here tonight. Um, I'm here on behalf of the whole museum to request a waiver from the building permit fee for the upcoming expansion and renovation of the museum. Um, this is a project that we hope to accomplish in 2007. Uh, next year will be the 35th anniversary of the Discovery Museum. And over the past um, 35 years, we will have served approximately 5 million people at the museum, approximately half a million of those people being acted in residence. Um, we are a, a unique regional resource, I think, in terms of um, the times of activities that are available to kids. Uh, our focus, thanks to a lot of support from the community, is to serve every kid. And we're very proud of the fact that last year we served 26% of the people who came to the museum basically for free. Um, this um, amount of uh, growth and support that we've had has prompted us a few years ago to begin to consider a major renovation and expansion of the museum. Uh, in July of last year, we completed a $1.5 million uh, uh, creation of an outdoor nature-based playscape, which we call Discovery Woods, which has been wildly successful. Our attendance was up 35% as people wanted to get their kids outdoors. The town uh, helped support that project. A uh, $150,000 grant uh, came from the Community Preservation Funds to help support Discovery Woods. Phase two of the project is a $5.2 million project, which includes $4.2 million worth of construction and expansion of our, of our science building and a million dollars of new exhibits. Uh, we've been actively raising money to support that project. As you know, the Discovery Museums is a nonprofit that's supported both through the combination of people who visit the museum, the memberships that they pay, but also 25% of our annual budget is through fundraising. The whole capital campaign and the expansion is supported through fundraising. Uh, we are coming to the end of our third year of that fundraising effort. Uh, it's getting ever more challenging, and with that in mind, uh, we've come to the town to ask for some support to help us in this $5.2 million project. Specifically, we're looking for a waiver of the building permit fees, which we approximate would be worth sixty dollars to $70,000, um, given the value of the project. Uh, there are, as you know, other direct inspection fees, such as electrical and plumbing, uh, that are paid through the contractors, and the museum would bear those costs where there's a direct cost involved. Uh, we believe that uh, the museum is a significant resource for, for both Acton and for the broader community. We believe that we're doing the, the right things to get kids prepared to be successful in the future. And uh, we, we would be uh, anxious and, and uh, hope to be able to work with you to make sure that uh, in recognition of whatever support you were able to give us, that we give back to the community even above, over and above what we feel like we're already doing. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members. Franny. I just love and I'm so proud of the Discovery Museum being here, and I'm so impressed. And I, I would move when it's time that we um, waive the, the fee, especially knowing that they would pay all the other fees associated with it, the costs associated with it. Uh, Katie. Yeah, I agree. Um, I have fond memories. I grew up in Hudson, but I have fond memories of going to Discovery Museums as a kid, you know, coming from there. And uh, whenever I tell people I'm from Acton, if they've got kids, that's probably the number one thing they know about our town. So it's a it's a fabulous resource. And looking at this picture, I'm uh, really loving your double helix crosswalk. And I really think we should put those all over town because it's amazing. <laughs> um, my, my one question is actually uh, uh, to the town managers, just since there hasn't been a formal application, um, how we kind of would go about approving this? Is it just approving the idea that we'll waive those fees? Right, it'd be, they be are? instructing the building commissioner to uh, that we would not be charging the, the building the fee. Okay. Fees, right? um, and then my question to you, Mr. Gordon, is just about this. I, I, I really appreciate your idea of offering some free memberships to disadvantage advantaged act in residence as one of the options that's the one I would lean towards and I was wondering if you'd thought about how that might work or if you've done something like that in the past um, we, we would be uh, interested in working with any organizations 
agencies, maybe the Act and Housing folks. Uh, we have a community service. Services, yeah, yeah my, my suggestion would be for, for Neil to work with Laura. Yeah, because she, she the community service knows, stuff. works with a lot okay. of uh, families. Have a couple, you know, yeah. however many number per year or something that she could give out. You know, and, 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 and I mean, it's an important part of our mission to make sure that folks are able to take advantage, um, given the size of the Acton population and the, uh, I don't think we would put any limit on it. If, if, if there was some, a family that they identified that was appropriate, we'd be happy to do it. That's great. Well, thank you so much, and, and I definitely support this request. Uh, Janet. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, I actually talked with Neil earlier in the day. I must be maybe the only person who's never been to the Discovery Me Museum because I moved here as an adult and I don't have kids. But, you know, the, the new treehouse expansion and the climbing area outside is of great interest to me, and I was sorry to have missed the sort of the open house uh, when I could have shown up, and but I was I was unfortunately involved in doing something else, and I was just I, I I yeah I would have been there with my sharp elbows trying to get into the treehouse, you know, and probably been out you know outsized by some child, you know, because I'm <laughs> I, everybody is now bigger than I am anyhow, but um, I do I was wondering you said I think in your introduction you were talking about the fact that a lot of people end up going there free I don't I don't know anything about the admission fees and membership and or, or what the the way what the structure is for how you you know take in collect fees um, I would be interested as Katie said in seeing if maybe uh, you could it provide that in an expanded fashion for the benefit of people in Acton who are deserving. I, you know, I think it's great if there are more Acton, if there, if all Acton kids aren't able to attend already in a subsidized fashion, I would, be, I think it would be great if generally Acton kids were able to, along with some interested adults, anyhow. <laughs> um, but, but I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit about, you know, what you said you were talking about the fees, and I didn't really, I don't know anything sure. about admissions at all, so. Sure, so um, most admissions, or most museums make their living uh, partly by the admission that people pay, uh, people buy memberships to be uh, members of museums, and then um, there's, you know, grants and, and other forms of community support. Uh, um, only, um, only about a third of our revenue is the direct result of uh, admission or membership. So we do, we do quite a bit of, of fundraising outside of that. It costs uh, $11.50, if, uh, if I got that right, to get into the museum, um, and, um, which actually makes us uh, cheaper than a movie and cheaper than all of the Boston museums by quite a bit, um, for those of you watching at home. Um, <laughs> And um, what, we, what we try to do is, is make there be multiple ways that people who have a financial need can avoid that, that fee. Uh, we are open every Friday night during the summer for free, uh, first Friday of every month for free. Uh, anybody who is um, holding a um, EBT card uh, can come in for a dollar any time. Um, we offer free admission to uh, educators, uh, so teachers come in for free. We offer free admission to uh, active duty military families uh, all year round. Um, our colleagues in, in the rest of the museum world uh, do that during a short period during the summer, that's, um, and, and we do it all year round. Uh, we think that's an, an important thing to offer. Um, and then we, we run a number of programs that are targeted at um, families with um, kids who have particular needs, uh, families on the kids on the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. deaf of hard of hearing, kids with vision loss, and all of those programs uh, are offered for free. And, and in fact, we even have dinner at those uh, as well, thanks to a number of the businesses in town who have helped supply, supply food for that. So like I say, last, Last year, in 2016, that just finished, uh, the museum served 195,000 people in total, and 50,000 of those people, actually in excess of 50,000 of those people, were either completely free or highly subsidized. Um, so we, we try to have a range of ways that people can take advantage of that. Um, one of the ones that I'm, that I'm suggesting here is the provision of, of um, 
what we, we call them discovery memberships, memberships that uh, would be available to people for free uh, that would be identified um, folks that, you know, the, the community service folks rec recommend. Um, we think that's a really good way because um, membership, uh, you know, if you were, if I was a credit card, we'd say membership has its privileges. Membership does come with other benefits. Mm. We'd like to see people feel that sense of belonging, uh, get our regular newsletter, get birthday parties for big discounts and, and those mm. sorts of things. So uh, membership is even better than just getting in for free. So, follow up, how much, how much is say a family membership ordinarily or do they range? Uh, um, a typical, uh, a family membership for a family of four, which is our most common membership is $140 a year. Okay, yeah, I, I now I, now you've suggested it. I like the idea of, you know, having a family membership as opposed to just sort of absolutely covering uh, free admission, as you say, because of the sense of, of inclusion and belonging that comes from being a member. Um, as I mentioned over the phone, my only, my only thought was that this is, I guess, I, I hesitate to use the word unprecedented because it, it's been associated with something else recently, but, but. Um, we don't, you know, we don't have a policy. I mean, this is all sort of discretionary. So I, I obviously, um, I assume that these kinds of requests, this, a request of this size would be a rarity. Um, and maybe we just have to say that this is, you know, specific to this particular applicant. I mean, this is rather unusual. This has been, this is a, an entity, a nonprofit entity that has been serving the community for a very, very long time and has, is very, very popular and is is expanding and continuing to be incredibly popular and a very uh, good, uh, certain, wonderful opportunity for people in the community. I mean, it's part of what I, tell, I told Neil, that dinosaur. I said, I look out, I look forward to seeing the change in the, the headwind gear um, every season, you know, which is so curious to see what's going to happen with the dinosaur. But anyhow, and I don't know where the, maybe you're moving the dinosaur. I don't know where, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> I don't see. I don't see the dinosaur in this. Place. Uh, yeah, she, she would. She would be off to the right. Bessie. Bessie is not moving. Bessie is an icon that <laughs> will remain right where she is. I think. Yeah. I think that that would uh, that would lead to an uproar or something exactly. happened to the dinosaur. So okay. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. I I just had a <coughs> clarification. Is it just the science part that's being re or is it that's being replaced? Um, the yeah. The, the the. The, the image you're looking at is actually the, is a um, expansion and recladding of the existing science building. So the, the science, the building itself will be completely renovated and expanded, but that building is there. Uh, the children's building, the original home of the Discovery Museum will remain right where it is. Oh, wait, but I thought but, when I was, yeah. yes, yeah, and, I and, thought I heard that it wasn't going to be the sort of we're, 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 it'll become the home of our of our of our birthday parties and used for special occasions, but it won't be a regular oh, okay um, a regular part of our visitor experience anymore. Okay, and I was also going to ask, and I think you mentioned the discovery membership um, at Safety Net meeting. Um, someone came, I forget her name. I'm sorry, um, to tell us about Allie. I think so. Yeah. Yes, to tell us about the discovery membership. And I thought it was like five dollars for yeah, and, so the, and complete membership for so, someone. So the way it works is, you know, there's there's a, a line of reasoning that people appreciate more what they pay for. So the, the officially the membership says that it's uh, five dollars, and in parentheses it says uh, subject to being waived. And, and and I think pretty much so far we've waived them all. So um, you know, we, I think that's a great idea, but I really like the idea of membership as. Yeah and having all the advantages that go along with it. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to echo everyone's, uh, everyone's sentiments. Uh, um, you know, I, the first time I went to the Discovery Museum was a while ago, um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, I, I, I went a number of times before I graduated and left town, uh, which was uh, sufficiently long ago that ever since uh, there has been significant expansion to your, uh, to your activities, <laughs> uh, which I was, ha which I've been happy to see, uh, and so um, you know, I think that um, the Discovery Museum has been an integral and wonderful part of Acton for a very long time, and so uh, you know, good luck uh, in your future, and I look forward to uh, you know more wonderful things from uh, from you guys. Great, thank you. 
Okay, well, let me express my congratulations and kudos to you, uh, uh, Neil, for uh, your leadership, uh, your vision, and uh, your fundraising expertise that you've brought to the museum. Uh, certainly, I think it did need updating, and you've come up with a vision that did that in a spectacular way. Uh, I was on the CPC when we funded the Discovery Woods. Both of my kids grew up going to the Discovery Museums and uh, actually worked there when they got into their high school years. And I'm going with their kids now. Um, <laughs> Discovery Woods was uh, more than worth the investment that Acton made in, in it of the $150,000. Uh, you know, I asked about why uh, you didn't seek CPC money, and I guess I wasn't on the committee when this was looked at, but apparently it was determined that the Discovery Museum is not fit within the recreation bucket that we need to uh, identify in order to fund it. I will say I was there on Friday with my grandson, and we were having a bet about who could make the biggest mess with the, <laughs> uh, with the uh, shaving cream and the food uh, coloring, and uh, I won. Uh, now, he'd dispute that, but I still say that I won, and that was play as far as I was concerned. That was recreation, so uh, I, I might look into that a little bit more, yeah, but okay. uh, uh, I, I will say, just for information, in terms of the finances of this thing, Neil mentioned that the subcontractors would pay the electrical inspectors, the plumbing inspectors. Those are contractors that the town hires to perform those inspections, I believe. And the fees pay the, uh, you know, the, the uh, money that we have to pay to uh, reimburse them for their, or pay them for their inspection. So that will be taken care of. Uh, the whole uh, building uh, permit uh, budget, I'm understanding, is in the range of $600,000. It's a pretty big department. 60. No, he's asking to waive 60. The, the, num the amount that we, the town, receives in building permits over the full year is about $600,000. That, uh, that's general fund revenue, um, but it helps support, obviously, the building commissioner and the people in the building department and some of the people in the planning department. So this is about a request to waive about 10% of the income that uh, the town receives over the year. Um, I do agree that it, uh, this certainly the benefits that the town receives out of the museum um, um, justify this. Uh, and uh, you're a generous offer of uh, free um, memberships to uh, needy Acton residents is, is great. Um, let me just ask you a little bit more about your other offer here in the letter. Uh, heavily subsidized school-based programs in the sciences, would that be bringing school kids to the museum? And um, yeah, it could be bringing the, the acting kids to the museum, or it could be our traveling science program that goes into the schools, uh, either one. And, and you know, we have a pretty good relationship with the school department folks and could work out the specifics of that. OK, so that, that also sounds like a great benefit. I don't know if you're offering both or one or the other, or, or I'm, uh, how's it going, or whatever. OK, whatever we decide, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any further discussion about what kind of uh, benefits you think we ought to uh, ask for? I think it can be worked out with the town manager and others. Okay. And the actual, Why don't we just yeah. uh, leave it up to you to talk to the town manager and uh, the school department if necessary and work out um, whatever you think is equitable Terrific. in return for this uh, waiver to we So uh, no further discussion? I'll make a Excuse motion to approve the request for a waiver of the building permit fees for the Discovery Museum. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thank aye. you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is an update on the Acton Leadership Group. I, this is kind of late. I was hoping we would have a uh, loaded into the computer the ALG plan so that people at home could follow along while we're doing this, but I guess we, we're not able to do that. Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I can't do it now. Um, okay. And I think, pardon me? Well, I mean, the thing of it is, um, the next meeting will be our next meeting before the next ALG. So, I, th you know, I think probably the game okay. plan tonight is just to lay out where we're at and then okay. maybe have more uh, uh, 
a discussion on what our position should be going into the 26th ALG meeting because I think that's where the, um, you know, things are going to have to get worked out. Um, the spreadsheet you have in front of you basically reflects uh, both uh, the town manager's recommended budget and the superintendent's recommended budget. This is the, the first time those numbers have appeared uh, in the um, in the ALG plan. Also uh, represents uh, the uh, preliminary um, uh, budget for Minuteman Tech. Um, and the main thing I think we want to uh, call your attention to is, is the fact that uh, in this in this model in the FY18 model, um, the tax levy is what we would say tax into the to the max. There's no uh, there's no um, uh, uh, Forgiveness, or I shouldn't say forgiveness, but uh, but no tax relief in, in this model. Uh, we used a million six in free cash that uh, FinCom has recommended in their point of view, and uh, as I said, the, the budgets are what have been submitted. Uh, now, one of the discussions, obviously, we've been having at ALG is is, is the FinCom point of view uh, calls for uh, not tax into the max to the tune of $985,000, which is what we have done in FY17, using a million six in free cash and, and, and having uh, the operational budgets in at 3.3%. So uh, that is really kind of what, what, this, uh, what this spreadsheet shows is, is, is a picture at this point in time based on uh, what has been submitted by the superintendent and the town manager without any you know, comment review from the respected boards. So I anticipate that when we get to ALG on the 26th, a big discussion will be about, I, I think it really comes down to the, the tax levy more than anything else, is whether uh, we would uh, tax the max or not. I think that's probably, if I had to uh, handicap the situation, feel that's going to be the crux of, of that discussion on the, uh, on the 26th. Yeah, let me just, I, I blanked out there a little bit, but taxing to the max includes using about 985,000 of on, untaxed uh, levy. Untaxed levy. Right. The reason we have that money available to go above the two and a half cap is if you look at the bottom of this sheet, in fiscal 16, we raised uh, the tax bill two and a half percent, and fiscal 17, we raised it 3.02 percent. And even though everybody talks about a 2.5% cap, the way the law works, it really isn't because you get to count um, all the new growth outside of the 2.5% cap. So that means you can actually raise taxes more than 2.5%. So we kept the increases for the last couple of years below what we were able to actually tax to. And that excess capacity that we didn't tax to in the last few years is built up and you have the opportunity now to um, include that in, in the um, tax increase. So the FinCom is saying they don't want to do that. Um, we're also including a million six out of our reserves of approximately uh, seven million uh, that the town holds in pre cash and stabilization. Uh, and there still is a Steve probably said this, uh, about $875,000 um, shortfall. projected shortfall. Uh, and if you add the 980 whatever thousand in excess levy capacity the FinCom doesn't want to tax or use, um, that obviously makes that more like a uh, million eight hundred and seventy-six thousand. So we got a we got a some bargaining to do. Yeah. Um, so if we're going to talk about this more at our, our next meeting, I think what might be helpful to help our board understand is perhaps to see what the recommended, what recommended cuts the town manager would make to get, I think, perhaps two scenarios. If, I mean, our current budget is a 4.5% increase, so maybe what a 4% and a 35 or you could do the FinCom's 3.3%, what those would look like. So that's really clear what those cuts to the recommended budget mean um, and then and then we can talk about kind of yeah, it's hard because we wouldn't be able to run the numbers exactly because we don't know you know I 
presumably there would also have to be cuts on the, on the school side to make some of these numbers work, but just understanding what those budgets would look like from our end so that we can make recommendations about what we might feel comfortable with and what, and then we can talk what we would be feel comfortable with in terms of the use of the unused levy and maybe the use of reserves, because those are the two things that are gonna, you know, actually balance this budget. Um, and I've got opinions on both of those, but I think it would be better if we talked about it kind of with that holistic view at the next meeting. Chin Chong. Um, I agree with uh, Katie's comment, but I also wanted to ask um, uh, on, uh, I thought that we were having like a 3.6% budget increase in the town, and why is it 4.5? Like, was there just a math error and? No, 3.6 is the operational budget. Uh, and to combine that with capital is 4.5. Oh, I see. Okay, so if you add the capital budget. Okay, I see. That's where that comes from. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I, the FinCom's point of view also has recommendations on the reserve levels. The town disagrees with their point of view. Uh, I mean, I have told, I told the ALG, in my view, that the selectmen would certainly support a reserve policy that looks at what reserves we have, where they came from, what we're going to use them for, and some plan for, uh, uh, you know, using them in the future and getting, and, and putting some kind of, uh, maybe a maximum on reserves the town should accumulate, uh, but that is gonna take a much longer period of time than, than uh, uh, setting the budget for fiscal year 18. So that's a longer process, whether it requires a committee or the staff of uh, uh, sitting down and, and working out some kind of reserve policy or whatever, but that I don't see happening during the ALG process necessarily this year. We've got to focus on the 18 budget, so, uh, and we have enough challenges with that given um, where the FinCom is and um, the schools and the town budgets are at this point, so. Yeah, I think, I think the discussion came up because in the town manager said, well, in the budget book, I think there was a reference to, to uh, uh, proposing reserve level between 3% and 8%, and there was a discussion about where, where did that come from, what did the board think about it, and I remembered there was some, some vague discussion, but I didn't, you know, Peter said we hadn't actually voted on it, but, you know, I, I don't think, I think we were uncomfortable with, uh, what we were uncomfortable with was FinCom's proposed proposal to hold the cap to 5%, which, was seemed very rigid and inflexible. So, but I mean, we did make the point at the SALG meeting that one, we're not going to talk about that, uh, the sort of reserves levels and policies. Um, but you know, we are prepared to work on, on something going forward. It's just that we're not going to resolve our differences of opinion about the policy um, as part of our discussion of, of addressing the fiscal 18 budget. So, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, on the reserve, it's been a point of discussion for a long time. The town has had adequate reserves. We've been using reserves every year to plug uh, a structural uh, budget deficit, I would say. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it turns out through a lot of, uh, of analysis that uh, the reserves build up every year, uh, I, I mean, it, it keeps building up uh, because the town uh, prudently spends uh, within its budget, underspends a little bit, so there are some uh, minor, usually 1% or less, turnbacks uh, at the end of the year. But the way the budget process works with the state, uh, we're coming out of a recession, people are buying new cars, or, or the excise tax increase on the autos are, is, is escalating, but we can't budget um, for a projected increase in auto excise tax, the state only lets us budget on what the history has been over the past few years. So by the time we get to the end of the year, we've had more revenue than we could budget for, and that all goes into free cash. So the, the way the reserves are building up is much more um, tax liens that we've collected that we can't budget for and uh, increased income that we're not allowed to budget for, even if we um, project that, that certain accounts, uh, local receipts might go up. So, 
Uh, one of the things ALG has been talking about, we've been in our, our plan been uh, in the out years, um, counting an additional 900,000 every year going back into the reserves, and ALG is now talking about somehow putting that on the front sheet here, uh, which wouldn't wipe out the $876,000. We wouldn't really count on it, but it would be pointed out that we anticipate there would be an extra $900,000 uh, based on his story, history uh, and additional uh, uh, money that would be available in free cash at the end of the year. So that's another discussion that's going on. And I, I think that um, we do get some lectures at ALG about how, you, you know, they really want the town to spend, start spending all these excess reserves on capital projects and, of course, I keep saying, you know, that's what we're, we're working on, a capital improvement plan, and that's where we're going. We have this, this, the, the stabilization funds. You know, the whole idea is that we're going to start putting uh, more of what has been in reserves toward the capital projects, but we're planning it. But that doesn't, that doesn't prevent lectures <laughs> about how we should be doing all these things. Um, and yeah, as Peter said, there is this discussion, and this is for ALG purposes, I mean, to include um, kind of like revenue, include projected uh, recoupment of, of monies uh, that will go into reserves, the replenishment of reserves, somehow call it, call it revenues, and just because everything's a projection, it will be our projection, it won't be, you know, anything that you could submit to the state, but just to clarify. And then also there, I think Marie uh, Alteria talked about trying to sort of set apart capital, capital that's covered in the operating budget because, you know, we ought to get credit for that somehow. I mean, if the idea is to spend reserves on, on capital, if you're using operating to cover capital, that, that should be reflected somehow. Um, so anyhow, yeah, the, the big discussion is going to be on our, at our next meeting on the 26th. So. Yeah, the big capital item this year is a new roof and uh, HVAC system on the uh, library, which is, is the leaks in the library. It absolutely has to be done. So it was put into the budget um, within the uh, allowable increases in taxes. Um, was that actually be bonded? So it would only be 70000 for for next year. But so, okay. All right, any other discussion? Okay, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Uh, board to comment on Martin Street 40B project. There is a hearing at the Zoning Board of Appeals scheduled for February, uh, January 19th. Uh, and uh, the way these 40B projects work, uh, again, it's a comprehensive permit that the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, uh, issues uh, that covers uh, all the other uh, normal permits that a, a developer of a regular subdivision would have to get from the fire department, the planning board, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, entities in town uh, all go through one uh, body, the Zoning Board of Appeals under the state law, and uh, the ZBA asks all town boards and committees to comment uh, on these proposals, this is a proposal for Martin Street across from Jones Field down in South Acton for approximately, I believe, 35 units uh, of housing on uh, land that uh, borders Fort Pond Brook. So I, I believe Janet wrote the letter that the selectmen uh, sent to the state um, before the project got approved by the state entity that will uh, provide financing. So do you have you have suggestions about this? Well, we have, um, yeah, the letter, I just have the draft, but I mean, we addressed basically four big issues, uh, understanding that um, this was a preliminary stage uh, that where the state was reviewing the site for uh, preliminary approval, and the project would come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and there would be further opportunity for comment. But our, our comments uh, talked about drainage, flood prevention, historical houses and barns. We expressed a wish that they try to, uh, well, we approve their proposed approval of pr preservation of the three historical houses. Um, 
and uh, I, it, I gather that in the latest plan, they're, they're, they are only preserving two of the houses, the third one being the one that was kind of iffy. Um, we also addressed density and number of proposed housing units. Um, and finally, traffic. I know that in the, the file, the ZBA file uh, for December, there were two folders. One was like December 21st and the other was December 28th or something. And I think, I think that the proponent must have just submitted all these documents just um, at different times. But um, one of the folders contained a traffic study. I think it's a December 21st um, folder contained a traffic study. So they have tried to address that issue. Um, but my thought was we could, if we have additional comments or different comments, uh, we could have a memo and then just attach the, the copy of the letter that we submitted to um, Mike Busby at uh, Mass Housing Finance Agency. But I didn't know if, if people, I mean, I'm happy to put something together. Um, the deadline is, I think, the what, couple of days before the hearing. So, um, but I didn't know if people had anything that they wanted to add to what we'd already addressed or. Uh, I, I like your plan, Jen, and I appreciate you, you taking the point on doing that. Um, I think the only things I might just point out in the memo is that they did the traffic, you know, study and mm -hmm. addressed those concerns at least through a study. Um, and then perhaps, I mean, I w would at least express disappointment that they only included preserving two of the houses, um, mm -hmm. you know, though we had sort of I ideally wanted to see all three. And then otherwise, I think all of our other comments still stand and they're things for, you know, the ZBA to consider as part of their larger, you know, discussion. And I mean, one of the things I would add about density is that um, the prior plan, and that was, I tried to flag the, the site plan, the original one that we looked at in, in September or October, but they originally had 32, 32 houses, okay. including the three. And then now it's, yeah. they're down to 28, okay. uh, because what they did was they, in the front line that's sort of closer to Martin Street, I think they got rid of one house, and, and obviously they're not including the third historical house. And then what they did in the second row is they had four, I think they had four of the smaller model, but now they have uh, separate houses, but now they have two duplexes, yeah. um, which are fairly sizable. I was at the DRB meeting and they were talking about, about that. I mean, their comments are not yet available, but um, you know, that is, is a change that they have reduced the number of houses, if not exactly really the density. And they've added, I think at the front, they have this, this parking area that's supposed to be covered. And then they've added some sort of a garden yeah, community thing. Garden. Yeah, they're, I guess they're trying to add some common area because um, one of the questions I know that came out of DRB is where, where did the kids go to play? <laughs> but um, anyhow, but not, you know, not significant changes other than that. They have, Conservation Commission has walked the land and I don't think, I don't think that they've issued a decision yet, but um, I had a question for you, your historical yeah. commission, right? Yeah. Did they get to visit the historical They houses? visited the sites, at least some of the members went to the site um, and visited the houses with that walk with mass housing. Um, so, but I thought that they wanted to actually have a chance to go inside. Yeah, right? I think they would like that and I don't believe they've had the opportunity to do yeah. that, not to my knowledge. I have to miss their meeting Wednesday, um, but they are meeting on Wednesday. Um, they, um, yeah, I don't think they've gotten to go inside. I mean, they, if the houses are on the um, cultural resources list, if they, when the developers apply for a, a permit, a demolition permit, they'll have to. Yeah. Although actually they don't, Never mind, because it's a 40B it's and 40B, we've actually had right, them weigh right. in that it, that it is overridden. But um, so um, they've seen them and they've commented you know, they wanted to preserve all three. And then the other thing yeah. that Anne's brought up is that there's that sidewalk that's like a historic sidewalk, actually, yeah, the stone one, but I, this wouldn't a, impact it, it turns out, because they're it's not. I uh, Maple, Maple and Martin or something, yeah. I don't know. They did, he, she, there was concern that the, the construction or something would affect that, Right. it's historical. But it sounds like it won't, because they're not yeah. doing any sidewalk work okay. there, so that's okay. Yeah, the 2832 thing confused me for a while, because the traffic study was for 32, and other stuff kept representing, referencing 32 
houses, and then I'm like counting and looking, and I only see 28. So that <laughs> that made sense. But well, that's a that's a the difference is a, an issue for for ZBA, ZBA to deal yeah. with, I guess. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I I, uh, I visited Mr. Gallagher's uh, development, similar development, right over the line in Littleton on two way. It is pretty dense. I got to mm -hmm. say, I'm surprised the fire department allows that design. I mean, there are stubs, so you just they're in the very narrow streets. You go down, and they just end. There's no like turnaround or no circle. Um, I'm surprised the fire department wouldn't have issues with you know being able to get trucks in and out of there, but. Mm -hmm. Um, there is plans for Jones Field. I mean, the kids could go across and play at Jones Field. I think they're they're doing away. The recreation department's going to do away with the uh, with the ball field there because it's not being used and uh, expand the um, the playground. I think. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I I don't think I've ever seen a traffic study that found that they were going to be the roads were going to fail with the new development. Maybe there are some and the developer then has to do some mitig mitigation or something. Um, but that's a pretty busy street, Martin Street. And uh, particularly now that the new train station is in, I'm sure there's more traffic in the morning and people are probably speeding through there pretty quickly. Uh, the sidewalk committee has had uh, residents of Stowe Street come and really make a forceful argument that Stowe Street uh, between Liberty and Martin ought to be on the top of the list for building sidewalks. Now the sidewalk committee has engineers on it and they have all these mm -hmm. criteria for ranking streets and they're saying well it doesn't really meet that but the residents are saying that the uh, high school girls cross country team actually trains by running down Stowe Street. Um, and I'd be scared walking down Stowe Street myself. Uh, I, I would consider asking the ZBA to require a sidewalk from Liberty um, down Stowe to um, Martin. Maple. It's uh, Maple, right? You mean? No, it's Martin Street. Martin Street. From Stowe, Stowe Street, because you from have Maple, and then you Stowe goes Stowe, off and it runs into There already is a sidewalk from Maple. No, there's Maple. no sidewalk between Maple and, and Martin along Stowe, where all the people who park up at Jones Field walk. Well, that's, no gonna be, that's gonna be built. That's part of the uh, train station improvements. Um, there's okay. money there, and that, that sidewalk is So you're talking about a long Jones Field? No, I'm talking about the other side of oh, Martin Street, right? Liberty Road is is farther down Stowe. Okay, okay. Um, so, I mean, I'd consider ask, asking for them to is build side, a sidewalk, sidewalk on Stowe Street. The sidewalk committee I'd support adding that. that to the well, I, the sidewalk committee's meeting Wednesday, so I can talk to them about okay. that. But this is a 40B project, so you know. Um, I guess normally, if there's already, I don't know what the sidewalk committee recommended. I'll find out. I, if there are already sidewalks on Martin Street, they may just say, um, put money into the sidewalk fund. I don't know. So we don't want to maybe go against what they're saying. But I'll, I'll find out. Um, our next meeting isn't until after the 19th, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, Okay, um, so I, I don't I don't know. Uh, you want me to talk to the sidewalk committee and get back to Janet, or, or? yeah, and go fine. with whatever the sidewalk committee recommends and include okay. that in the memo. Usually, we ask if there's a sidewalk for a donation to the sidewalk fund, um, but maybe we can ask that it be earmarked or indicated as for sidewalks in this area. You know, right. kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, if you get some, if you get something more definitive out of the sidewalk committee meeting, that would. You know, and it looks as if they would be supportive of that idea, then it's fine. Okay. This all right. Well, uh, that's Wednesday, so I'll, I'll send an email around about what they think. So, And I'm understanding that if they are okay with it, that the board would agree to recommend that? Okay. So, uh, I guess. Um, I support in general the comments specific to this development that um, you know Katie and Peter have added. Um, but I also wanted to at least mention that um, it might be worth thinking about. I, this is obviously not the appropriate time to have a full discussion, but it might be appropriate to start thinking about um, you know 
what we want to do about 40B developments in this town. This came up at uh, the on budget Saturday. Um, and I think that um, it's a concern that the town is getting nickel and dimed all over the place by these 40B developments. Um, and so I think that at some point the board should, some point in the near future, the board should probably consider, um, you know, path forward and whether or not we want to continue to deal with this as we have been. Uh, and I just wanted to bring that up uh, as it's relevant to the discussion at hand, but not like directly so. It's worth noting, but it's also worth noting that we have a housing production plan that deals with our affordable housing that was put together with our comments and with the comments of the public in a public process. So I think we can continue to have that discussion, but I, you know, I just want to make it known that, that we have a housing production plan that addresses the town's um, action steps towards getting to our affordable housing goals and getting to the 10% of affordable housing um, that was put together with a public process. So it's not as though we haven't done anything. And I think there were some people at Budget Saturday and on Finance Committee that don't understand that. Well, I, I could see that we did that. I was one of the people that mentioned that. I would like to sort of take into account the Housing Production Plan and Act in 2020 and our situation now and look at it and bring it up. Ha just have further housing discussions because um, I do hear a desire from the housing authority and I sort of agree um, that we're really um, going very piecemeal and slowly toward our 10% and I would like to do something about that. So I'd like to see that on an agenda, a future agenda, to maybe talk more about that. Yeah, we're never going to get to 10%. Uh, what's being developed now is, is you know, smaller uh, home ownership projects that just the 25% affordable units are the only ones that count toward the 10%, and they're not, we're never going to get there without a very large development. Uh, uh, Selby mentioned on Saturday Grace property. He's uh, pursuing possibilities there, uh, if we can ever find out who owns it and how to get in touch with them and possibly the uh, auto auction site, I guess, although I'm not sure people would want a huge, you know, development along uh, Route 2 there. Um, so there, there are always those issues uh, about, uh, again, Avalon is on the very edge of town. You know, if you're going to build a 10-story building, um, nobody wants it anywhere near their neighborhood. So. Uh, uh, those are the issues, basically. Well, so I still do have um, hopes for this, the Main Street site. I didn't understand actually what you said about the Main Street site, something about a school, putting landscape comments. Would that include other options? Some. Some oh, about the Walker, the former yeah, Walker property? Yeah. yeah, we're meeting. No, it's not about landscaping. It's a landscape architect school. Landscape architects are just would help us provide options for what kinds of things could go there, which would include potentially affordable an affordable okay. housing project. Okay. But again, I'm just going to reiterate that we have a, essentially a town policy that's the housing production plan that we put together as a public and as a town that's been also approved by the state that is a plan to get us to 10% housing. And there's... There are also reasons why we haven't pursued, you know, a project like the Concord Muse because people don't want it in their backyard. And also, I think there's this idea of, you know, not wanting to just have an affordable housing project that, you know, that's where we put all of our affordable housing and we don't have to deal with it anymore. That's also not a great way to deal with affordable housing. So there's a lot of issues there. That's why we had a public process to create a housing production plan. I'm not saying don't talk about it in the future, but recognize that we have been talking about it and coming up with a thoughtful public plan <laughs> that we put together to work towards affordable well, housing. Well, the, the, yeah, I mean, the, the benefit to something like Concord Muse, it's a rental project, as is Avalon. So it's not like you put all, it's not like a housing authority project where everybody who lives there has to be eligible. Um, it's only 25% affordable, but under the rules of the state, because they like to encourage rental housing, um, you can count every one of the units, even the ones that are market rate. So uh, a rental unit like that has a much greater benefit to getting toward the 10 percent than, than... But it doesn't have actual greater benefits towards getting towards actual affordable housing for people. So that's why we've had these kinds of discussions as a town about what we want our policies or plans to get to that kind of affordable housing to be. 
that's why we come up with things like the housing production plan. So I want to just make sure we're not just having these discussions as a board and coming up with alternate policies when we know that we've done this and that we should keep continuing to have those conversations as a town about our housing production plan, but I don't want to get in the trap where it's just the board talking about it and also not recognizing that work that has happened, even if everybody doesn't know about it. Um, one of the other things I, I would say that AL, um, not ALG, Budget Saturday discussion, uh, you've got two perspectives, representative one, uh, one you're, you're talking about Acton Housing Authority and as I said, very different, different constituency from Nancy's contingent, but also, I mean, there are people like Margaret and others who are in a big hurry to get to the 10% and they really, they want a big development rental because for that very reason, you know, only 20, I think it's only 20% have to be affordable, but the whole 100% if the rentals counts, um, very different philosophies or motivations for wanting a large number of uh, rental, you know, moderate income or low income rentals. And so you have to be careful about who you end up kind of having a lie at allies because you may at some point diverge <laughs> because the interests aren't compatible. There are people uh, who just want to get to the 10% and they're not necessarily that concerned about uh, the impact on the community as long as the building is out there somewhere, far away from the part of Acton that people tend to be very protective of. And that's why, you know, Avalon Acton was, you know, not very controversial. It was tough for Conservation Commission because there were a lot of wetlands, but for the rest of the town, I don't think that there was really uh, any objection. Uh, you know, nobody's saying, oh, preserve our heritage, our rural heritage or our historical buildings, because there, there weren't any involved. But yeah, anywhere else, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to have a big, big building like that. Um, I look forward to conversations still, even with all, both ACHC and Accident Housing Authority and considering we have also Kelly's Corner. We, we have a lot of thoughts, the things that we can consider. So uh, anyway, but my, the point about this is I definitely am in support of getting some sidewalk mitigation um, from them. I also am disappointed about the, the group house was stop, dropped because it couldn't be counted toward 40B. And I feel like sometimes we accept these things just like, okay, so, so it didn't help you. It didn't, it didn't financially um, benefit the developer, so you dropped it. Okay, we understand why, you know, and that house, okay, I guess it would be too expensive to keep, so okay, we're gonna lose an historic house just because, um, because it didn't financially be as attractive, it wasn't as financially attractive as you wanted it to be, and we just sort of accept it. And I'm, I'm very disappointed that we don't have a group house, and I'm disappointed if it's too, I mean, I think we should also look at this letter, and they've had trouble with flooding, and they're con this letter from Ann Corcoran, concerned about the density. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? But that's what our yeah. letter did mention, density, concerns with density, concerns yes. with flooding, yeah. and, concerns, so, so of, and concerns about the three houses. We so we're submitting that again to the ZBA, saying these are still our concerns, okay. and we would so like I to guess have our the concerns third house. Are still in there. Right. Yeah. But it's just, it's not our decision. We're not right. the I realize that. so but I express concerns. I just want to um, well, the other make thing sure about, that about the historic houses, I mean, them. honestly, you know, I, I, I mentioned it to some people who are into historic preservation. I said you could do what Acton Conservation Trust is and develop a fund. You know, you, but you'd need some real deep pockets to save houses. I mean, you have to keep an eye out for them when you see historical houses that are kind of deteriorating because the owner doesn't have the means to keep it up, then you need to have a relationship with that person and see if you can, you know, you, basically you have to acquire it. And it may be that it's not that expensive, that expensive to acquire. There are people who do that. You know, they enjoy rehabbing historical houses, but you know, you can't just rely on people like that. And you, you know, and honestly, when a developer comes in and wants to sort of uh, improve on a site that where, that's occupied by a house that's about to collapse or something, it's almost at the point of being condemned, then 
Um, you know, it's very hard to say, well, we want you to do all, do all that, and then also we want you to preserve the house, but we don't want you to have anything else around it. I mean, basically the developer's gonna do what the developer finds financially feasible to do, so. And that doesn't necessarily include preserving the house, which, but that's where other people have to step in and, you know, can't, there's a limit to how much we can expect a developer to do. I, I guess it's frustrating never knowing really what the line between financial feasibility is and financial optimization. <laughs> well, well, the ZBA, um, and the usually is my understanding, I don't believe I ever sat on a comprehensive permit when I was on the ZBA, but they have the ability to hire experts, and I believe they do. So, so these 40B projects have limits on the amount of profit. We've been burned by this, but the town has. Yeah. But I have limits on the amount of profits that a developer can make. And I believe the ZBA hires their own independent consultants to look at the pro forma and um, the financial analysis and decide whether, you know, um, it, it works. Okay, is yeah, it we no, through I, with that discussion? Okay. Yeah, and I will, I could draft something, and then, but then I'll wait to hear from you about the sidewalk issue. There's okay. Because basically, um, there's a few things that Katie suggested, so I'll just. Yeah, I, I do feel good about building ha housing near the train station. I mean, that is good. I, I do have concerns about the comfort of it being so, quite so tight. I like that they changed to two family. I mean, that will help a little bit. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. Number seven, request to dispose of obsolete material from the Active Memorial Library. Number eight, Eagle Scout Court of Honor uh, for Mark Chudik, Daniel Walton. I believe there's a third person that was involved in the request. Yeah. Have to look up his name. Um, Number nine, one day alcoholic beverage license, Jinji Tang, January 15, 2017. Number 10, accept a gift of uh, $2,500 from Roach Brothers to the Recreation Department to support the 2017 Summer Concert Series. Number 11, accept the gift from the Recreation Department, uh, for the Recreation Department of 2,500 from TD Bank to support the 17 Summer Concert Series. Number 12, accept another gift for the Recreation Department totaling $1,000 from Setcrest and Bloom LLC to support the 2017 Summer Concert Series. Number 13, uh, Another Recreation Department gift totaling $500 from the Acton Boxborough Cultural Council to support the Chinese Music and Dance Night on August 24, 2017. Number 14, accept a gift for the Recreation Department totaling $500 from Workers' Credit Union to support the 17 Summer Concert Series. Number 15, Accept a gift for the Natural Resources Department of $1,198.69 for a memorial bench to be placed in the Shoba Brook Conservation Land in honor of the son of Dr. Robert and Mrs. Marsha Hill. Number 16 is a committee appointment of Benjamin Blumenthal, full member, Act in 2020 committee. Number 17, selectmen to approve 2017 Board of Health fee schedule. And number 18 is approved the meeting minutes of August 8, 2016 and September 19, 2016. Move to approve consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. Motion carries unanimously. Um, I believe it's uh, now time for a Most motion to adjourn. to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.